My name is Ignacio Sirac. I am the director of the Theory Division at the Max Planck Institute of Quantum Optics. I'm a theorist working on quantum information theory, and we're trying to find out what quantum computers can do that classical devices cannot do, how to build them, but also study what are the phenomena that occurs when you have many objects interacting with each other and fulfilling the laws of quantum physics. Quantum is the theory that describes in physics the microscopic world of the things that are the smallest things. And one of these small things are photons, which is the particles of light. And when we talk about optics in physics, we are referring to light. And therefore, quantum, because it's the theory that describes the microscopic world, and optics, because it's about light. Entanglement, that's a word that was taken to quantum physics by uh, Schrodinger many years ago. And it's uh, the basic feature that makes quantum physics very different from any other theory that we have in physics. The first thing that you have to do in order to understand entanglement is to understand just the basic uh, question about uh, quantum physics. Otherwise, it would be impossible to understand entanglement. So the first principle of, of quantum physics is that the properties of objects may not be defined. Okay, so that's a very deep uh, uh, sentence and with a lot of meaning. So we are used to say that any object that we have around us has all the property defined, independent of whether we are looking at it or not. When I say uh, the moon is there, then it's there independent of whether I'm looking at it or not. Right? In quantum physics, in this microscopic world, that's not true. So the properties of objects are not defined or cannot be defined or may not be defined when we don't observe. So when we say that an atom is there because I'm looking at it, then it's there. But when I don't look at it, it's not there. And it's not that I don't know where it is, it's that it has not defined still these properties. So the world that we don't see has not defined properties. So you can have, for example, one photon that is moving in this direction or in this direction and in this direction, and it still has not defined its property. One can have another photon that is moving in this direction and this direction, and since nobody's observing, it has not defined the properties. Entanglement occurs whenever these two photons, when you observe one and you define the properties of one, then automatically the second one has defined properties without observing. So again, there are all these many possibilities and if I observe this one here and I see that it's moving in some direction, then automatically the other one defines this property as well. That's the, the, what is very special about entanglement. And of course, it's very weird because in our macroscopic world, everything is defined, so it doesn't make sense to talk about what I'm talking about. But in the microscopic world, where properties are not defined, then this entanglement has this special meaning. In principle, every piece of matter or of light or of force, anything that is described by the laws of quantum physics can be entangled with some other particle that fulfills also the laws of quantum physics. In order to display this phenomena, it's very important that it's isolated because there are so many degrees of freedom that are entangled with each other that at the end you don't see anything and it behaves very normally. So you have to have a lot of control and this only occurs in the labs. That's why if you want to have some experiment of quantum physics and to do something in quantum physics, you probably have to build a building like the one that we have here, and then you have to work in the labs that we have here that are specialized for that. Quantum physics tells us that nature and whatever is surrounding us is very different from what we thought to be. So we thought that there is a life, there exists a reality beyond us, and that this reality is as we perceive. Quantum physics tells you that the reality is not as you perceive. Maybe it's not even defined 
when you don't observe. So we are not simply spectators of what is already defined, but we are actively defining what is around us. And this has consequences in philosophy. Indeed, there are many philosophers, several philosophers who have, are analyzing that question very deeply. Quantum physics is 120 years old. It took a while, 30, 40 years, in order to develop at the level that we understand it. But at that time, even the theory existed, and the experiment did not exist. So even people were arguing that what I'm saying about this definition of properties and so on, that it could not be true, that nature was not like that. And it took about 80 years or 100 years in such a way that people had the possibilities to do experiments in the lab under the isolation and the conditions in which these properties arise. And these experiments took place in the last 20, 40 years. And he said now that, okay, so we have crossed a frontier because we are now able to exploit some properties that nobody else exploited in the past. And if you look at history of science and technology, whenever it was able to cross a frontier and to have access to that and control of that, then there were many applications. And that's what is happening now in the field of quantum physics. We have lasers, we have TV, we have you know, uh, superconductors, we have uh, NMR in the hospitals. This is thanks to quantum physics. And quantum physics offers us new ways of uh, dealing with information. The way in which we typically send information over longer distances, it's through uh, optical fibers or through the telephone. And the way in which we process information apart from our brain is in computers. And these two ways of sending and processing information does not use these rules, these new rules of quantum physics that we have now accessible. We can, for example, send information in more secure ways just by using these laws of physics. For example, I can make that the information disappears from me. It doesn't go through any place and appears in your site without crossing any place. And in that way, nobody can hack it. It's uh, thanks to this laws of physics, these laws of quantum physics. Or we can process information and make computers that can do computations that otherwise no supercomputer will be able to, to do in the, in the future. So what I was saying is that um uh, we have been trying to, to start with an initial state, right? Mm -hmm. The idea of a quantum computer exists already for about 40 years. And at, in the first 15 years, it was um, uh, something very abstract. Uh, so you say, if it was possible to build a quantum computer, we could do that and that and that. So we will be able to process information with these new laws. However, nobody knew how to do it in practice, or even if it was possible with practice. So nobody came and said, okay, take that and take that and take that, put it together and in this way you can build a quantum computer. And uh, so I think that together with some collaborators and other people in the world, this was uh, my contribution to that. I mean, to say how to build a quantum computer. Now the next step is that you would like to know what problems can you solve with a quantum computer that may be interesting and uh, you cannot solve with the standard computers. And that's something that we are uh, looking at now, so we are doing research on that. There are other pro theoretical problems, which is, okay, so why don't we have quantum computers right now? It turns out that it's very difficult to build them, and the reason is because, they, as I mentioned before, then they have to operate in a very extreme set in conditions, and these conditions are very hard to obtain. So as a series, one can think, so can we get around these conditions? Can we find some other conditions which are more suitable and still run quantum computers? And that's another question that theorists ask. Another one is, so what happens if these conditions are not perfect and there are errors in your quantum computers, so things maybe not, not don't work that they should work? Can you still be useful for something? Can you exploit them? and our institute offers is an atmosphere that is very special, that is very hard to find in some other way. I mean, apart from being intellectually very high, it's surrounded by some of the experts, world experts in the field, and with the best equipments that we can find in the world, probably. This intellectual environment does not only allow you to solve some say, interesting problems that people have uh, thought that they are interesting, but other, uh, something that is more important is to create problems and to see that there are some other questions that can be answered. And uh, that happens through collaborations. So we talk to people 
and then we discuss. Then you really have to sit down and to think about that, try yourself, think for a couple of days and then come back and again, bounce it back to somebody and see what is the phase that is having with your ideas. And why I like it is because I like a lot of mathematics, I like uh, philosophy, and I also am somebody who likes applications. I like that something can be used for society, and this quantum physics combines all three, and I think that there are not many others that combine all three. Thank you.